started. So welcome everyone to our March Houston Beekeepers Association meeting. We are so glad that each of you has joined us virtually, of course. Um, today we have a great lineup of speakers and fun things to give away at the end of our meeting today. But a few things ahead of our uh, speakers, I just want to run through the, the regular business that we do uh, every month. So today we obviously have some quick announcements as well as our speakers. And then don't forget to stay around for our virtual door prizes because we have some amazing things coming up. As a reminder, your dues for the 2021 year, calendar year, January for December are due. So please go ahead and do those online through our website, or you're also welcome to send a check to us in the mail, either one. But your donations and membership go to these great speaking events where we get to bring in wonderful speakers like Sherry and James today, and all kinds of speakers throughout the year. So please don't hesitate to join for $25 as an individual or 40 for a family, you get all this networking as one of our neighborhood beekeepers as well. And of course, if you're local, then we can actually loan you some beekeeping equipment when it comes to extractors or some of those tools that you might not want to buy off the bat if you're a neighborhood beekeeper. So please keep that in mind as you join our membership list this year. So just a reminder, we did turn over a few of our board members. I'm so excited to share. Obviously, myself and Joe are continuing on this year, but we also have Laura Mullen, who has joined us as treasurer. She's waving there. Um, and then Kyle Wolf as our secretary, and they are doing an amazing job. If you are ever interested in giving back and volunteering time, please let us know. We are always looking for extra hands to support this amazing club here in Houston. So with that, I am actually gonna turn it over to our speakers, Sherry and James Elam. They are going to speak today on kind of the annual things to expect as beekeepers, as we support our bees in our backyards and neighborhoods all over Houston, and some cans a little bit farther. So if you don't know the Elams, they are part of Texas Bee Supply and even before that have been in beekeeping for many, many years. And they are a frequent speaker for us because we love them so much. So today I'm going to turn it over to Sherry and James and let them uh, not only educate us, but probably entertain us for the next <laughs> month, for the next <laughs> hour. Thank you, guys. <laughs> No pressure there, we, right? We do not tell jokes. People just <laughs> laugh at us because we don't know why. <laughs> oh, gosh. I think that's what it is, too, right? They, I'm going to have to pull my program back up. Hold on a second. There. All right. It's all yours, guys. Great. Hold on. I just probably a need second. to occupy a little time since Sherry's clicking through the screen. Okay. Well, thank you for having us. I'm, gonna, James, oh, I'm oh. sure you can take up some airspace. Oh, no problem. I'll stop talking though if I'm going to have airspace. Oh, well, I wonder if I'm going to share my See? screen. It's not, y'all, you keep talking. And I'm going to um, minimize this and get my, get my, uh, my ducks in a row here because see, we re, we redid our, um, we redid the. Your uh, talk. Yeah, well, the snow, the signing on. See, there uh -huh. we are. There we are. I actually found my photos I took at our last in person meeting in February of 2020, which was y'all were the speakers. Yeah. The last time we actually got exactly. to know in person. Our so, last in person speaker. And we had 90 no, people there. Wow, I do too. Yeah. We had 90 people there. Can you believe a year has gone by? <laughs> we, much like y'all, probably were. We were at the um, at the rodeo. Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. Me too. On the day that they canceled. The day they I was there the night before. Yeah. Are you really? <laughs> so that was, was March amazing. 10th, and we were there March 11th. Well, now that I finally do have my ducks in a row, I had a, <laughs> apparently a sound issue. But hi, everybody. I hope everybody's doing good, and and um, they're um, warming up from that really really cold snap at Valentine's Day. Um, some of was that, that Valentine's it was, it was, wow. How time flies. I know. And, you know, we just kind of hunkered down like everybody else. It's really, um, as we talk about 
seasons of management, a lot of what is normal for right now has been a little bit pushed back because of that snow mageddon. It truly has, and, and it, it's it's odd where it's showing itself. We we've had really good drone activity in our colonies for quite a while now. Right here, here in Conroe. Mm -hmm. But we were working some of our bees over in the Dayton area where the store is, and there wasn't a drone one to be found in mm -hmm. any colony. So it's really odd how such a short distance can can reflect one hour what the yeah. uh, the weather conditions. And I would have thought it would have been opposite. I would have thought that we would have been the ones without it, but right. so, be it. so be it. Well, at annual management, that's a big topic for- It's all year. For, I mean, <laughs> compressed into less than an hour. I know. There's a lot going on there. I but I know one thing, if we're gonna have a management agenda, then we have to have a plan. That's right. And if we don't have a plan, then we're gonna fail throughout the course of the year. We're gonna be, be backtracking on everything we're trying to do. So the importance of understanding what the seasons have to offer, mm -hmm. even if they're out of kilter just a little bit, is, is extremely beneficial. Uh, existing beekeepers um, kind of have a good feel of where this is going. <laughs> new beekeepers, uh, some of it hopefully is new to you yeah. and we hope to help you. Well, let's tell them what the seasons are. Seasons are different for beekeepers than they are for, let's say the, um, our CPA. <laughs> for the IRS. <laughs> like it's uh, it, right, right. The quarters aren't the same. So what our spring is actually February through May, and then summer, June through August. Fall is September through November, and then winter is December and January because it's this big. Unless your Texas in February 14th, 2021. <laughs> and then there's um, I don't think you can call that winter. Can you call that winter? I don't know what that was, but we don't want that again. We do not want that again, but we are to spring. We are finally seeing some, some blooms reappear and things happen, and it is the busiest time of year for beekeepers. It is. A lot of times uh, we wonder, you know, we, we, we get a visual of what our colonies are doing, and we think, yeah, that's really good. Or hmm, I wonder if that's really good. <laughs> if I only have one colony, I really wonder if that's really good or if that's really bad. So that brings up a good first point, I suppose, is we always encourage more than one colony. Sure. The, the more the merrier applies to beekeeping as well. But without belaboring on that topic, what we see in one colony and compared to another colony, yes, it's relative, but do we know what a strong colony is coming out of winter? Right. Uh, the, the national standard is coming out of winter, a strong colony has six to 10 frames of bees and 10 to 30 pounds of honey. The importance of the honey is that we know that those bees didn't, didn't hit a, a period of starvation. That's right. Therefore, they didn't get stressed mm -hmm. and they were happy bees as they could be if you're gonna be an overwinter old adult <laughs> bee. <laughs> well, that, you know, you, you hit that point and that is, I don't wanna let that slide by that truly an interruption of um, food source makes a big difference in how well our bees fare, um, how well brood fares, the, the productivity of that brood and the uh, viability of that brood. And, and you're exactly right that the fact that they were able to come through winter with some stores still intact, that, that meant a lot to us. We actually didn't lose a single hive and every single one of our bees came out with stores still intact, but you know, not all, not all had that to go in. But well, it is, a, it is a crucial time for management and that we need our plan going forward. Um, did I feed pollen? Did I not mm -hmm. need to feed, feed pollen mm -hmm. through the month of February? Normally we would not uh, because we are beginning to see some, some uh, trees come in, mm -hmm. uh, some elm and some ash are providing some pollen sources for our right. bees. But if our bees, uh, they won't have a tremendous amount stored coming out of winter, but they will have some. About 20 hopefully. pounds, hopefully 20 pounds. And no, you know, y'all, that's pollen, really only pollen. two uh, I've pollen. Said pollen, yeah. It's so uh, not that. 20 pounds of honey is really only two frames of where, bee where frames. I was, where I was going with the pollen statement, though, is that uh, sometimes we, we aggressively feed pollen when we don't need to. Oh. Uh, so this in February, typically, we don't need to add pollen unless our bees have been confined due to periods of extreme mm -hmm. cold or rain. That's right. So uh, 
Holland Patty's internal during February only if right. there's been a, a problem with the bees being confined. You remember me talking about Valentine's Day? I do. Did I miss Valentine's Day? Well, I think we all did. <laughs> did I get anything? I don't think I did. <laughs> we were too busy prepping, getting our bees ready. Um, really and truly, and I know we're backing up by a month, but we're doing the whole year. So y'all bear with us. If you didn't do this last this year, you will next year. So full hive inspections on a nice warm day in, at, right at February, February 14th. We'll just say that, start to love your bees. You're gonna be checking for population. The condition of your colony, like James has been talking about for the last few minutes was of how, how did they fare? Did they, are they hanging in there? Um, because January may have been a rough month for a lot of bees. Uh, source resources can start to dwindle in January. We're really stressing, especially like in the articles in the magazine, we're stressing, check the weight of your colony. Make sure that those resources are still there. We briefly discussed earlier population. You have to have something to compare population mm -hmm. to, yeah. to know whether you're, you're in, in a good position or if you're struggling. Mm -hmm. And one of your cues to that obviously will be, what does your queen laying pattern look like right. and all the little things right. that we'll talk about in a little while. Well, and that's part of it, right? Brood, how much? How, what's the condition of that brood? If there is brood, and you know, we're Southeast Texas, so we tend to see that girl lay all winter long, such as winter is. We really only saw any interruption just for that week to 10 days of that extreme cold weather. Um, beyond that, we didn't see her slow down except just a small amount in our area, and probably the same for y'all. Are you seeing space for expansion when that explosion is about to happen? I think one of the biggest issues with new beekeepers is being able to spot when expansion is imminent. A, um, a rule of thumb for experienced beekeepers is if you've got a frame of capped brood in mid to late February, you really and truly need to, you will be seeing some full capped brood frames that will constitute three frames of bees. So one frame of capped brood, once they emerge, are three frames of bees. So if that gives you a feel for if I have three frames of capped brood at the end of February or the first of March that we're fixing to head into, you're going to need to start thinking about space for expansion. That's true. This is a good opportunity to bring up the basics of beekeeping and that uh, our honeybees need a dry, safe hive, right. whatever the hive is. Safe. <laughs> say safe. That's right. You know, away from bears and, <laughs> and coons and Ooh, <laughs> whatever it may be. for sure. Um, they need large reserves mm -hmm. of food, mm -hmm. which is our pollen and our honey. Mm -hmm. What else do they need? A queen. Well, they do need a queen. <laughs> Ideally, they need a nice young queen yeah. so that the laying pattern mm -hmm. is never interrupted. Right. But where I'm going with this, the next one is they need space for expansion. Right. If they don't have space for expansion, either of the brood nest or of their honey storage, then we're going to come up into a swarm condition, which That's we'll right. talk about in a few yeah. minutes. So then that moved on to what I was trying to segue to too soon. Queen, can she make another year? You know, ordering queens this year is going to be a little different. All of you experienced beekeepers that have are just used to February, first of March ordering that those uh, replacement queens, things are gonna be a little delayed this year. Uh, some of the queen breeders just started grafting, um, gosh, 10 days ago at the, at the soonest, I believe. Uh, I see Sandy right shaking her head. Um, they could be delayed. So if you want to order a queen, get that done it still may be May before you get one from some of these breeders because of backlogs. So that's part of the planning that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Now we right. know. That's right. Right. Yes. Well, What's next? This thing, this computer not working right. Well, next is pests. There, there we are. go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it well, is. We always want to control our pests regardless of the time of year. Yeah. Specifically, uh, coming into the first of the year, once our brood nest is beginning to expand, we would love to do a Baroa test prior to having a lot of, of capped brood within our colonies. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to, to uh, confront the issue of killing them um, 
without having to deal with cap sales. That's right, and in the winter time, you got a little less um, options for trading for Varroa. So really uh, pay attention to that. And if your mite loads are really bad in February on that nice warm day when you check, go into honeybeehealthcoalition.org and look at what's the best way to treat them um, for February. We're coming out with, Blake's working hard on it. We had hoped it would be ready by the April edition of the Texas Bee Supply Monthly, but I'm not sure of a one page answer sheet for treating for Varroa. And it's gonna be, a, my temperature's this, my high population is this, and the answer is here. And it's gonna be all on one page. So uh, as soon as that comes out, we'll be having that in our programs. Are there, are there any um, topics in beekeeping which are controversial? at all? Well, Varroa might be one. Yeah. Well, what's another one, though? I don't know. The next slide. <laughs> Here's one. <laughs> Do we Varroa, Varroa. Do you have a bottom board or a screen board? I mean, there's literally a billion things that are I know it. Some, people, <laughs> I know. some people are fight to the death of a friendship. That was, that was a test, wasn't <laughs> it? It was. That was a test. Well, here's one of those topics as well. We believe in, in at least experiencing the mm -hmm. opportunity of, of beekeepers understanding that there potentially is a time to reverse boxes. Mm -hmm. We reverse boxes. If we go through the winter and come out um, and, in February or the first of March, we mm -hmm. see that our OB is in the top of the box. We reverse it to give ourselves room. We believe that if you don't do that and the queen is delayed in moving back down, then we might just spin off a swarm that we didn't want to do. So we take that preemptive action. Just FYI, those that don't may survive just fine. That's right. And, they all may be and well. you only do but that if the brood nest is migrated to the top only. And I will tell you, when James and I were in our bees the week after, well, 10 days after Snowmageddon, we reversed every single one of the ones here at this bee yard. One of the tough things about it, I think why some people may have an aversion to it, is that especially for newer beekeepers, decisions that need to be made may not be fully understood regarding mm -hmm. reversing and, mm -hmm. and am I really breaking up that brood nest is more of, of the brood in a location that when I start switching and moving, am I separating the brood nest and interrupting what's really going on? Uh, so it's kind of one of those things where you want to study it and learn from your mentors mm -hmm. or from the club when it's appropriate and when it's not. If they've all moved up to the top box and your resources are up there and nothing going no on question in the bottom. Then. No right. question, no question. All right, continuing on. You'll want to add foundation frames if needed. And that, that basically means you might need to pull some honey frames and put in some drawn found frames for that queen to lay. You'll continue to feed needy colonies two to one sugar syrup. If you did not have the required storage for your bees, if they didn't overwinter with, it said 10 to 30 pounds, but we feel like in February, we probably need to have that 20 to 30 pounds. Mm -hmm. That 10 is not enough because if you get caught in bad weather, bees can go through 10 pounds in a day and a half. That is None so true. Think how strong they are. But then same, the opposite is true. If you've got a thriving colony, you're going to want to turn that water, sugar water over to one to one syrup to be more like nature intends at this time of year to be thin like nectar. And that's going to sti stimulate that queen to continue what she already thinks she's doing and that's ramping up. Also, that is huge for comb building. You're gonna get a much faster comb build up on especially new foundation. If you've had to do a play in a little equalizing game, that's gonna get you that as well. You know, it's so easy to, to put a jar of sugar or, or a top feeder or, or a yard feeder area feeding, it's easy to get sugar water to our bees. Mm -hmm. It's more difficult to understand when and how to handle pollen. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's one of those things which yeah. is almost a class in itself, but supplementing pollen if need, pro, pollen protein mm -hmm. if needed. Um, you really have to understand the, the importance of, of the relationship between our carbohydrates and our protein and that our, that our, mm -hmm. our honeybee our larva, uh, that's their only source of food is bee bread and it comes from the pollen. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we really want to understand that. And that, a lot of that comes through bee biology. That's, that's exactly right. <laughs> and also knowing when your, your brood is showing whether they need pollen or not. That's dry brood, by the way. Put a pin in that one. All right, so one of the busiest time of year for beekeepers. We caught up. We're we March, did. right? March. Yeah. March. <laughs> We've got spring begins this weekend, Saturday. Yes. 
It does. The spring solstice. Isn't that amazing? It actually is going to happen. Pay close attention to expansion when this happens. 80% rule. 80%. Strong colonies are already uh, beginning to beard. Mm -hmm. uh, weak colonies. What, you know, what, what can we learn by just looking at the outside of a colony? Do we have to do a, do we have to do a hive inspection to understand what's happening in our colony? Mm -hmm. Not at all when, when things are to the extreme one way or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, we have so many colonies out there right now that are just busting at the seams and I'm trying to get that feel. You know, we did our hive inspections mm -hmm. a week ago mm -hmm. and we made our proper adjustments, but they're still overloading and hanging. That's right. And uh, so we have to keep a close eye on them this time of year. It says add a second deep. Uh, Sherry mentioned the eighty percent rule. Mm -hmm. uh, when when a brood box, a honey or a honey box reaches eighty percent capacity during a nectar flow, it's suggested that you add an additional box. Now there's there are methods, proper methods for adding, which we won't go into at the moment. But realize that if you do not add, the bees are going to do something on their own. They're going to do that one more right there. That's right. Called split. split. In, the, in other words, known as a swarm. Right. So we can we can do it ourselves, or they can do it for us, but. Hanging, the, hanging bees in March is a, is a sign that, yeah, you did a great job. Maybe you did too, too good of a job. Too good of a job. And the issue that we're running into this time, this year, y'all, is that we've got a lot of beekeepers, phone calls, emails coming out every day that people are wanting to split, but the resources aren't there. Like we said in, in Dayton Huffman, the drone availability was low. For whatever reason in that area, it was low. So if I can't get a queen and the drones are low, am I, am I doing walk away splits right now? I'm not feeling great about doing that. Um, a lot of times this time of year, we can do them easy peasy, no problem, not worry about it. But this time, this year, it's not really going to work well for a, at least another week to 10 days, maybe even we, a little longer. We have to believe that whatever is happening in our, our colonies out in the bee yards is exactly what's happening mm -hmm. out in nature, yeah. with the exception that hopefully our bees are in a little better condition. Yeah. But if we have an abundance of drone activity on our frames and then our colony, then odds are we have that same source of, the, of drones in our drone yards that are up above us. The question is, is that the caliber of a new queen that you really want? Answer so no. that's one of those, that's <laughs> one of those plans that you have to go from experience. Do you like the queens that are created within your yard or do you like the genetics that are available from outside? That's exactly right. I love this video. I hope that y'all are getting to see that it is in motion. We so took that yesterday. No, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't. The weather didn't look that good yesterday. <laughs> I wish it did, but no, swarm season does begin. We are, um, we are there and it's such a strange time with the way this is going on, with the way the, um, with the deep freeze we had at the moment. I'm gonna say this year is different than any year I can remember in any recent years that um, the bees are still busting at the seams and ready to either go up or split, but our resources aren't really ready for it. The trees are running behind where they were. They are set back by week to 10 days, two weeks. And all of a sudden things are a little ahead of our control. But you really and truly, if, um, if you are, have more than one colony, let me just say this. If you've got more than one colony, you can do some like moving things around to put it off until you can make a split or just keep enlarging that brood nest so that you can prevent these swarms. Yeah, we used to say that either we raise bees for bees or we raise bees for, for honey, honey, but mm -hmm. you can't raise bees for honey. Right. Well, how's that go? You can't raise bees <laughs> no, for honey right. and bees. Well, you actually <laughs> you can you if can. you're a small scale beekeeper, right. of course you can. But that what that's leading up to is that if swarming is a leading cause of colony loss, then regardless of what my plan is, Either I lost my bees or some of my bees, mm -hmm. or I lost the capacity to collect the honey that right. I wanted to from that colony or those colonies that swarm. So swarming is a huge deal. And that quite often once swarming occurs, the head, it's kind of like not getting enough Dr. Pepper. Sometimes you drink you drink one and then you go, you I could really use another yeah, one. one. And you'll pop a new can and you may just use a little bit of it. But sometimes that first swarm, while well, it may take 50, 60% of the bees, uh, it may still have to throw off another 10% or so right. before you know it. 
that colony is gone That's from right. the standpoint of being a production colony right. this year at least. Well, and, and if they swarm, did that daughter queen, was she able to mate and really do what she needed to do? Um, just be prepared that this time of year is swarm season every year. And we've got to maintain that space and keep it, keep it right. You know, something we probably enjoy doing too much and that is enlarging the brood nest. We love going in and seeking opportunities to balance uh, resources and balance pollen and, and, and uh, honey and, and bees and we move calf around brood and, and open brood. We love thinking that we're smarter than they are. In reality, <laughs> it's really just something fun for us to do. It is. But it is productive in most cases. But you know what? I, I think that that's a comfort zone. And I think a lot of you, especially if you're a new beekeeper, we're comfortable going in. We've got multiple colonies to choose from and taking something from one and putting it to another one that needs it. And being able to do that, especially in spring, is such a huge benefit for our bees. And we are not smarter than our bees, no. and they show us that on a daily basis. But I, would, I would certainly rather fail trying true. Than, than to fail just because, not I, was trying. Bee, because I was a beehaver That's and not right. a beekeeper. That's right. So if your hive was low, moving forward. If your hive was low on honey going into winter, then March is the month that they may start. And you know, that sounds so strange and I'm gonna bump that back by two weeks because of everything we've been talking about. But because the population is rising so fast, there are not enough foragers and uh, pollen and nectar in nature to feed these babies as they're being laid and being growing into the colony. So all of a sudden you've got a population of 10,000 that you didn't more that you didn't have just a few weeks ago and it's still the same workforce that's trying to feed them. Well our, 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 our older bees, the, the long-lived or long-lived workforce long -lived. that uh, were raised in the fall to, to overwinter within our colonies and last more than that 42 days, they're gonna last for months and months. Right. They're the girls that are out trying to collect this nectar and this pollen mm -hmm. to support the brood rearing. Right. And the brood went off things successful. When we, when we have the proper resource in that colony, they're expanding more rapidly than is the workforce because the workforce is decreasing and the, uh, the responsibilities are increasing. That's right. That's our opportunity for starving. And I, and I underlined these two to one sugar star, syrup for starvation, one to one for stimulation. We talked about that for February, that if they're, if they're hungry and they don't have the resources, two to one still. And that's really all year, y'all. Two to one sugar syrup is as close as you can get to a honey, um, mimicking honey, hun honey's viscosity, and they will be able to consume that. So one to one for stimulation, two to one for starvation. You know, when that stimulation uh, doesn't show a, an initial response, a couple of weeks, three weeks go by, and you see that colony that you've now deemed a weak colony. Mm -hmm. One thing that we've learned over the years, at least from our perspective, is that a colony this time of year that has two frames or less of bees, that's a colony that has a real problem. We're not, going to, we're not going to say the queens has to be requeened. We're, we're, not, we're not making any assumptions whatsoever. We're saying that a change has to happen because mm -hmm. that colony cannot catch up. There are multiple Odds things are. that can happen, that can be done. It can be combined with another colony. Mm -hmm. It can be requeened, um, you, but you have to take some action because mm -hmm. a colony that's that weak when your other colonies are doing well, yeah. uh, feeding pollen substitute or feeding sugar water is not going to overcome the issue. Right. The issue is more, more severe than that. Most likely it's queen issue. It is, and when he said that, I underlined using pollen patties. Be real careful because we are in Southeast Texas, hive beetles. We have a little bug called a hive beetle, and um, it's kind of just part of our beekeeping. The further north in the state you go, the less of a problem you have, um, but they are a problem for us, and, and that pollen patty is absolute bait for them to pupate. You know, it's so funny. And, here on our property in Conroe, Montgomery County, we truly have a hive beetle issue and we have most of our bees mm -hmm. on a hill. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sandy, there's no reason for the ground to seem moist. Right. Uh, the bees that we have over at our store in Dayton, Texas Bee Supply in Dayton, uh, if you're familiar with that area, like Houston area, that's low ground. Mm -hmm. And the soil there is really damp and wet most of the time. 
and there's not a high beetle one in those colonies. Makes no sense. It, everything that we think we know about <laughs> high beetles goes away right. in that respect. That's right. But maybe it's just the caliber of the bees. Well, it probably They're tough location, bees. location, location, <laughs> location. We got a lot of trees around us too. So, and that last bullet point, depending on the year, you may get to put a honey super on. I know that this time last year we were putting supers on. Um, it isn't happening right now. A, a, a given um, in beekeeping on an average year <laughs> is that honey say. supers can, can start going on March 15th. That's just, is it time to put a super on? You For go, well, is it is. March 15th? Yeah. Well, yeah, it is. Uh, but this year it may be a little bit different. No. We, uh, we do find that we have a lot of nectar coming in mm -hmm. on, our, on, our, on our colonies. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have just some started. supers on. Mm -hmm. I, but well, uh, even though we're running a little bit behind, there is nectar out there. There is nectar out there. Just remember, and this is also a rule of thumb, that they're not going to store surplus honey unless the bottom, the, where the brood nest is, is packed full. So they're not gonna go, okay, you want that box full of honey? Well, I'll go ahead and stop what I'm doing down here and put it up there. That's they true. won't do that. That's true for whether it's your, your, uh, uh, your single deep or if you're a double deep. If you've still got foundation to be drawn out, in the second deep, uh, throwing a super up top is not going to work, especially right. if the foundation needs to be drawn out. That's right. Uh, throwing new foundation up for a super is a good way just to waste your time. That's right. April, we are nearly there, y'all. Wow, it's near, the really, program's nearly April. over and it's already April. <laughs> <laughs> Colonies are, should be fully operational by the, by the beginning of April. April can be and will be cold and wet, depending on what the weather wants to throw at us. Uh, frequent hive checks. Go ahead and get these bi-weekly hive checks to ensure your food stores are still good because, it, you know, again, nature is doing its business, but your, your population is exploding. So this is part of your calendar, part of your checklist, to-do list. And here we go. If we, if we have a weak colony that's, that's two frames of bees mm -hmm. or less, that colony needs to be combined with another colony, right. assuming that it's disease-free. Oh, don't, be, don't be transferring problems. Three frames of bees or more the problem, you still have a problem, but requeening will resolve that if they'll last that long. Mm -hmm. Add an additional box if you still need to, because it's still not too late. You may have come out of, of winter with a single deep. If it's still growing population, which it is, then you're going to be need to be ready for adding another box. Discontinue feeding when you add your honey supers. Now that that is unless they're completely brand new. We pardon me, we encourage you to feed until you see a fist size amount of comb being drawn on new foundation in your supers or even in your brood box if you were to be adding another brood box. Get that comb started and then stop feeding and then you can leave it for the bees to continue and on. That is a good tip, especially for new beekeepers that haven't experienced the failures that, mm -hmm. that seem to come trying to draw a new comb at your tough. discretion as opposed to when the bees want to do it. Right. If we if we if we have a really great single or double deep and we have new foundation that we're working with and we throw a queen excluder on it, mm -hmm. um, bees don't like drawing foundation through a queen excluder. Not too so, much. So uh, throw your throw your They'll super throw your slow. super up um, knowing that it's quite possible the queen may go up there and lay in it, but throw a super up and get that fist of uh, comb drawn. Mm -hmm. And then if you're if you're a uh, queen excluder believer, then put it on once some foundation has been drawn mm -hmm. and you'll be much more successful. That's right. And odds are she hasn't gone up there yet. She won't do that usually until it's drawn out more than that. But that is that is a good rule of thumb. I know a good way to make honey fast. How's that? Feed sugar water to your bees while your honey <laughs> supers are up there. <laughs> that do that it. makes it really quick. You know? Or is that honey? Do you remember? <laughs> I've got a picture on the wall. I'm going to tell on myself. I got a picture on the wall of our very first bottle of honey, and it's just as fair complected as it can be. You, Wonder to this what day, it was. To this day, we can see through it. <laughs> and uh, gosh, it tasted good. Yeah, it was so good. It's, tasted, you know, a lot like sugar water. Sugar water. <laughs> <laughs> I did not stop us from putting that cute little label on it. We were so proud of we that. We still have it. Yeah, of course. We, we entered it in a honey contest. No, not that But one. we didn't win anything. <laughs> <laughs> Not, that one. Not that one. All right. So it's still April. It's time to receive your nudes. Yay! Yeah. So many of us, if you got Yay. in on, if you got in on early yeah. ordering for bees, uh, one of those earliest dates is usually an April 15th mm -hmm. date. 
yeah. sometime around that time yeah. period. Uh, those bees are still on schedule for the most part they are. with most with most uh, providers. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, here we come. We use the, I forget what do we call that box? Pronix. Pronix. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a saw yeah. uh, for our bees. Looks like Easter but, eggs. Uh, I know it. But uh, they're on schedule. They're coming. And uh, the, the neat thing about, about um, nucleus colonies, regardless of the color box that they're in, is that they all need fed. If they're going to have the opportunity to be part of your productive workforce, come, come your major nectar flow, then you're going to have to feed them and help build that colony, help them get stronger and stronger. So you'll, you're, before you know it, you're going to be taking those and within a week, two weeks, most likely, mm -hmm. yep. into a single deep, and your goal is going to be to grow it. That's right. And that one, that's why you got to continue your frequent hive checks. And also keep back stock of woodenware. I can't tell y'all, I, I tell on ourselves a lot, but how many times in our beginning years that we would get out to the bee yard and even only having a few colonies and we would get out there and find we needed something and look at each other and go, Sherry, which we you don't get. Well, or didn't have it and, and didn't just when didn't have it. You've got to order it and you don't have it, but you need it now. So keep some back stock of woodenware. You will need it if not today and not next week, you will need it later. And on learn to rotate your inventory. Huh. It's yeah. pretty interesting in that if you've been beekeeping three, four, five, ten years and you're only adding supplies as your number of colonies grows, everything that you've got in the bee yard is aging at the same rate. And sure. you find yourself having to replace all your boxes at one same time. One. Kind of do it like we do our flame, frames. We, we, we encourage people to rotate their frames out. Yeah. Uh, let's rotate our equipment out too. Pre-plan that. I'm grinning extra big because that's where we are right now. Isn't it? I know everything we have is... <laughs> It's like our it's boxes. Like, it's like a pine tree laying on our, the ground. Our boxes are at that point. <laughs> I, I'm sure that no one can relate to where we are. Um, some of some of our boxes got mended with duct tape the other day. But we use white duct tape on our That's white right. boxes. It matches. It does. So it's all good. All right. Let's get into May. Let's get into May. Add or continue to add supers as necessary. You know, May is a month very much like April is in that there's not a lot of distinguishing characteristics about it. Our colonies are there, they're growing. The flowers are still in place like we've got on the picture there. Uh, nature is providing for our mm -hmm. bees really well. Mm -hmm. uh, ideally, our, our colonies that are singles or double deeps uh, don't need fed. They're doing their thing. They've got their supers on them. Pest management is really all we have to do. Mm -hmm. That's, that's and, exactly right. And swarm prevention. Swarm prevention. Because we're still growing. You know what I just noticed? Doesn't that look like bitterweed in that picture? It kind of does. It kind of does. Got another glasses on. But you know, a flower is a flower. A flower right? is a flower. Right. But I think I need to change that picture. Those that know what bees like. That was uh, just on that slide. I'll be darned. But well, yes, you're right. All Pest flowers are created equal, aren't uh -huh. they? Like all bees are created <laughs> yeah, equal. Sure. That's they all right. have the same temperament that's and the same right. abilities. Uh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Guess what time it is on this slide? It's summertime. It's time to extract all our honey that our bees did for us. It's great. Now, just keep in mind, new beekeepers, if you got your nukes in April, this isn't the same for you. You will not most likely get honey your first year. It's your second year. We teach in our beginning beekeeping classes that just look forward to doing that your second year. But we totally encourage you to take a frame or so out of that uh, box that you have and test it because I'm sure it's very, very good. Everybody has the opportunity and the right to take a little bit of their little own bit. honey, even in their first year. And your honey is the best there is, of course. All right, so during that extraction, we're going to stress that you don't over harvest. Watch for robbing. Y'all, can you see that video? I hope that it's videoing for y'all to see what this robbing frenzy is. When you harvest, that absolutely gives the bees in the neighborhood an open door with a big neon sign that says, come on. We want to share what we have here and you may end up losing that colony that just did such a great job of giving you honey to this event right here. Harvest time is, honey harvest is kind of, kind of a catch 22 if we remember that movie and that there's a box with all this gorgeous honey on it that we've either been extracting from for a week or two or a month or mm -hmm. we're just letting it build up. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we, when we go in and we take it, 
and uh, we do it to all of our colonies, then there's an overall absence of food within each individual colony and all the others that we have present. Mm -hmm. And we're doing this at the beginning or the edge of, of summer dearth when the flowers are not out there. They don't have the ability to replace it. So it's crucial that we understand right. that we have to keep those volumes of honey in place. We never extract from the brood nest from box one or from box two, uh, if both of them are your brood boxes. Uh, you never go into that except for that one personal frame we told you about in the That's first right. year. But from then on, it's a no-no unless you want to share it with another colony. But that leads to robbing when we overdo it. That's right. And spillage does as well. It does. Egg laying is going to decrease as it heats up. The queen will slow down. So don't panic when you see much less brood happening. That's normal. The less resources coming in the colony, like James just said, nature has dried up then the less that she is going to be laying. Forces us to have to feed again. That's right. It? Continue to make splits if you if there is still some flow going on and that's your goal to make bees and not that, honey. That's a good point. I don't know that we, we stressed that earlier, but uh, and, and learning splits, the various types of splits and when to make splits, spring or fall, uh, how late in the season, how early in the season, the key considering factor uh, if you have any questions at all, whether you're going to be successful, is always do it during a, during a nectar flow. If you can, sure. Bees can overcome so much of what we as beekeepers oh gosh, attempt to do, do to them when we may not understand what's happening. But if we have a good nectar flow going, they can like take an eraser out and go <laughs> and, and say, they really didn't do that. We're going to fix it. Uh, and that's really true. They're forgiving. In the in a nectar flow, they are forgiving, like which is I did. I don't yeah. think that they could hear you good though. Oh, okay. I'm playing. <laughs> I'm playing. All right, continue to feed, like you said, one to one sugar syrup or two to one if it's a wheat colony. It's really okay, even in the dearth of summer and test for varroa. If we were going to after your harvest, if, test for varroa. If we were going to put a highlight on anything we've talked about up to now, other than the test for varroa in the February in the early spring. Uh, when we take our honey, uh, regardless of how you believe you, you, you handle Varroa, uh, whatever type of methods you prefer to, to, to take care of them, you have to test Varroa instantly after you've taken your, your honey your off. Honey. That's right. uh, the, the populations are the greatest that they'll be all year. And if your colony is going to collapse mm -hmm. any time other than from overwintering poorly, it's going to be at, at extraction time because Varroa will destroy them. That's exactly right. It's summer. This, this, this is what I've been, as I still have my little heater sitting over here to warm my feet every day. It is this time of year in summer, not this time of year, but in summer, it is hot outside and your bees are doing just that. They're just doing like this. The picture that I've put here, that's to show you it's hot inside that box, but that's not a swarm, okay? Learning the difference between I'm hot and maybe could use some ventilation in the top of my, right under the lid, maybe some toothpicks or a penny or whatever to, to allow some hot air to escape. That That's this, as opposed to a ball on the front that could be a swarm. I, my, my analogy to that is if it looks like you got a ball of bees and went and splat it on the front of the box, that's I'm too hot. That's what you do with spaghetti, isn't it? It is, throw, throw it against the refrigerator see if it's ready. I thought so. That, but this is literally just bees that are hot. And what they do is just come outside, start fanning, doing that little circulatory, um, putting cooler air back into the hive and relieving some of the population in there so that they can cool off a little bit. First thing I think about when I see that, of course, is not a swarm. If we know it's summer, and it's, it's late July or maybe early August, and those bees are all over the face of that box, then mm -hmm. potentially we have a ventilation problem, so we mm -hmm. want to address it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we probably can anticipate that the brood rearing has dramatically slowed down. Big time. And we really don't want that to be the case because we're, we're, we're entering the, the season or the time of year where we're preparing our colony strength to overwinter properly. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of months to go, but we truly encourage the feeding of pollen patties to continue some brood production within that hot summer box. You can do that. Because nature tends to not provide very good, very good pollen during that late July, August period before our fall nectar flow begins. And in small amounts to so saw your high beetle population. Remember one of those, one of the statements that I made earlier? It was something like, oh, where did it go? This. No, it was He's got notes dry everywhere. and safe, large food reserves. And I could say, large continuous food reserves. Mm -hmm. Our bees should never be stressed mm -hmm. due to food. 
honey nectar or, uh, or pollen oh. and or water. We do a lot of research and writing for the magazine and in doing program presentations. And one thing that is consistent that you will see that the, um, I'll go ahead and say the .edu's and the .org's have found out long, long ago is that any interruption in nutrition damages the bees. It causes them to not be, um, not only not healthy, makes them more susceptible to any of the bad things going on with varroa mites. It stops the brood from being as productive or viable as it was. It stops the queen from being as viable. Keeping a consistent nutrition level in your colony truly is what you just said. Yeah, it is huge. Really, really does. If, if, you, if you think long and hard about a, a, a larva within a brood nest and it being dry when mm -hmm. it's supposed to be wet, just mm -hmm. swimming mm -hmm. in uh, a bee bread, uh, think about that larva and what the future of it's going to be if it survives. Mm -hmm. If it's dry down there, well, yeah, it's going to get a little bit of some food if it's going to survive. It's not going to be a productive. But you know, it's not. It, it may be one of those bees that doesn't find its way back. It may be a bee that doesn't know how to leave the colony mm -hmm. or to fulfill one of its duties uh, uh, within, a, within a house bee status. Right. Um, lots of things can happen to bring a colony down simply due to lack of nutrition mm -hmm. or improper nutrition. Right. So summer is one of those times where we don't allow that to happen to our bees. That's right. August in Texas, does, does it look like that? what your backyard looks like? <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Dearth, little or no forage is what that means. What you need to do is put a put a, a buzzard up on top of that. I know. Cactus. Oh, I do. I really do. This is a crucial time for our bees. There's nothing blooming and small amounts of pollen coming in. And I think we've been re that throughout the season of the hot summer. Well, I know this bottom part's right. Bees may become cranky Goodness. and bad tempered. We always struggle with whether we call our bees uh, aggressive or defensive. defensive. But one thing we know is that when it's hot, cranky and bad tempered cranky. actually fits. It does. They don't want you to mess with them. You're gonna have to do your regular hot checks, but know that if they're cranky, it's because they are hot. Uh, bees need a large amount of water. In do bees August. drink water? They, they kind of just use it. Oh, okay. I kind of just use it. Make sure there's a water source available for them. Um, it doesn't have to be clean, clean water. Bees like it when a little algae is growing in a dock tank or, or a vessel, you know, what do you call that, bird bath type thing. That's okay. Just make sure they've got some somewhere. Well, truly it's important because you're using that to thin the honey. The mm -hmm. honey has to be thin in order to be created or mixed with pollen to make bee bread. That's right. It, that's their only method of cooling the colony. Mm -hmm. uh, they transport the honey suck it up in their proboscis and deposit it in the cells. And then when they fan those cells, the water is like a is like the old timey, at least for our area, of, I'm trying to say water coolers, but um, what's it called? Evaporative, Evaporative cool. coolers. It's the same concept that they cool their hive with. It is. The water is just crucial for the bees. And remove this uh, store, remove and store supers that aren't being filled. And the reason that we, don't leave an empty super on there is for well, multiple reasons, but one, it's more air space they have to condition and keep at their temperature, their optimal temperature. It's also wide open for wax moths or small hive beetles to move in, and then it's just a pest problem for them. So remove them if they're not being filled. August. Oh. September is very similar, except in fall, we have the potential of seeing some type of nectar flow depending upon where we are in the state. Yeah. Ours Go is ours is is I'm gonna say a little bit below what I would have think would have thought it would have been way back when we started. Even though you've got goldenrod planted in my flower bed. Uh, yes. And it's doing so well. Oh it is. I fertilized it yesterday. Oh okay. yay. But it, <laughs> fall is a great time as it says to consider requeening. Uh, I know a lot of beekeepers do not requeen in the fall. There is kind of like this is a the thing we're supposed to do in spring, but we are a believer in uh, requeening fall in the fall requeening. because it gives your, your colony the opportunity and for that queen to prove herself and you to have the opportunity to replace her mm -hmm. if she does not fall under the guidelines that you had hoped she had. You can still do it again in spring, but there's nothing uh, that makes my experience in the bee yard uh, more positive and or more negative than to know that a queen is underperforming or performing well. One of these, you know, it's one way or the other. 
and you don't want to be caught when you can't get one. Um, we do a program called Maximizing Honey Production, and that program, that method, and our method is requeen in the fall. That's a September requeen, the last of the last of the season, because you can't get them much after September. You, we do that, and then we've got a brand new queen coming out in the spring, and it's wonderful. And we have maximum honey production. And she has the opportunity to not be stressed for the first yeah. few months of her life. She can so just consider that she can play the game for a mm -hmm. while, yeah. and then the pressure zone comes spring. That's right. I remove supers after fall nectar flow, if not leaving for food stores. And I put that in italics because a lot of us, us included, leave um, some supers on, depending on the colony. We don't leave them on all of our colonies, depending on the colony. If you aren't going to leave them on, this is the time to take it off. Weigh your hives. Do that tilt test. James and I did a video that's on TexasBeeSupply.com uh, YouTube channel. Um, it, it's easy. Are we running out of time? No, we're doing good. We're doing good. Unless Sandy somebody still. says we're not. Yeah, Sandy cut us off anytime. <laughs> uh, do a tilt test. It's, it's easy. Just get back at the back of base of the, the box with a high tool and lift it up. See if it still weighs a lot. Do this all year so you know what the high, when it's doing good, what it should feel like when it's full of stores. And that way, when it's not full of stores, you'll know because it'll be much lighter. If, if that box moves on your platform We've had when, that you, happen. when you address it, then you have yeah. a problem. If you barely bump it and it goes whoop, off the platform, you might have a problem. That bottom statement, most important time of year, you know, what we alluded to this earlier, but what we do with our bees in the fall totally determines what their capabilities are come spring, That's exactly how well right. they're going to overwinter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, are they the bees that we want to take care mm -hmm. of, we're just going to let them survive mm -hmm. as opposed to thrive. So we we ensure that they they have the opportunity to stay dry. We ensure they have the opportunity to consume the pollen that they need. Uh, this is the time of year that a lot of beekeepers love to do dry pollen, the November, December, mm -hmm. even in the first mm -hmm. of January, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to inside pollen. It's actually kind of fun if you want to do it. Pollen you substitutes. To I really that's, I love to play with bees. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to winter. Okay, that's that's a picture not unlike a few weeks ago, isn't it? That actually isn't from a few weeks ago, but it's like it. So for beekeep beekeepers, winter is your opportunity to repair your woodenware. You take your break time, spend time with your family, trust yourself that you did a good job leaning up to winter and that your boxes are nice and full because you've done a tilt test. You can paint your boxes with the bees right inside. It doesn't matter. Those bees don't care because they're cold. They're inside. They're clustered. It's really okay. It's kind of a lot of fun to be out there without a suit on and uh, just painting that box away and matching the and snow with white or whatever color you want. Right. Yeah. One, one point. Third bullet point. Third one. We don't insulate boxes in Texas. Well, you may be the exception if you live in the panhandle or somewhere. Yeah. But if you, if, if you try to insulate a colony in southeast Texas or anywhere along the Gulf Coast, um, you're going to end up creating a terrarium, terrarium instead of a uh, safe, dry place. I know that there was some people that lost their hives that wrapped them. And I was saddened to hear about that. Um, it's so confusing of do I or don't I? Um, and I can tell you, it's, it's really okay to not. It's well, really you know, okay to not. YouTube videos are not area specific. When they teach you how to do something, That's it doesn't true. necessarily, you know, what, what we even though Texas is a big state and we like to think of us all being kind of a homogeneous, you were Texans. Um, we are. What the, 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 the weather conditions in uh, Del Rio are, are different than they are <laughs> in Dallas. I like yeah. to use two Ds. Uh, wow. Wow. <laughs> and wind Denmark. Break, wind, <laughs> Denmark. wind breaks and reduced entrances. That's your, that's your, <laughs> Our puppy's crying. Our puppy woke up. <laughs> wind breaks and reduced entrances. And that's what James did for the winter storm coming. He put up wind breaks behind our bees. And it wasn't even at their entrances. It was at their backs. And, and again, they did fine. You know, and, and another thing that I think is important in that when the weather's really cold, be it December, January, February, or March, um, if, you're, if you're attempting to do something positive for your bees in regards to feeding, uh, or regards to pollen, like a pollen patty. Mm -hmm. uh, if the bees are in a cluster, they will not break that cluster to obtain the goodies that you're trying to provide them. That's right. They'll either survive or they'll die. Mm -hmm. So 
we take care of them prior to whether it looks like this right. because they're not going to break the cluster to go up and get a pile of fatty or to go up and, and try to get some cold sugar water. Right. It does not happen. That is true. And I already blinked that order your spring bees. You absolutely want to be first in line. All of us that have sold bees for years, and I know there's some in this group, we, we put these bees out to offer early, usually September, the spring bees, because we want to give you the ability to get them as early as possible. The sooner you get them, the sooner they can grow into a productive colony. So order your bees before New Year's. Our that, dog thought somebody, he was sleeping, he thought, thought another dog got his Frisbee. Oh, is that what it yeah, was? That's oh, it. Yeah, that's <laughs> You got sidetracked. There truly there. is nothing. There, well, there's not many things more depressing than to see everyone you know receiving their bees that you that they were ordered. Oh, no, no, And you waited till last order. And you're yours. getting them in May, the end of yeah. May and you, June. You're getting yours last and you're, yeah. you watch, listen to them talk, especially as a new beekeeper when you're still learning. Yeah. So it's, That's it's right. good to move fast. Order your bees. So January. So we made the pull again, didn't we? We started with February and we're going to end in January. Monitor your box weight, continue to do that because it's still winter, whatever it is, whatever the year provides us, it's still winter in January. Prepare to ramp up your supplemental feeding for February. And that, what that means is order your supplemental feed, get your feeders cleaned up, do what you need to do, be prepared, proactive to get ready to ramp up your feeding for February. We always say that we never go into our colonies just because we want to as, at the 55 degree or below point. A basic hive inspection shouldn't occur at that time period. If there's an emergency, anticipate that your bees are, are, are starving or something mm -hmm. really, really mm -hmm. bad, then go out, go in if it's 22 degrees. Sure. You know, do what you can do to salvage what, what can happen. Mm -hmm. But a general hive inspection, stay at that 55 or above. If your bees aren't flying on a sunny day, mm -hmm. there's a reason for it, they're clustered. And don't go breaking it just because you want to go check on your bees and see if they're all right. If you have to do it, tap on the side and I'll promise you, they'll let you know that they're in there. That's right. But you might want to. Well, I'm going to back up one bullet point and say, order your supplies. Build and paint. Get, get your supplies ordered for January. Get that done where you're not standing there at the store in line with everybody else trying to get all those last minute supplies you need. And then, like James said, keep your quick peeks to days that are warm. You know, something that we, we missed. We okay. talked about the uh, the uh, spring solstice. Mm -hmm. We didn't talk about the winter solstice. Uh -huh. Winter time, I think it was December 21st, mm -hmm. was the winter solstice, which is the day that that uh, makes the breaking point. The, the scale tilts and our days start becoming longer. Mm -hmm. Our bees recognize that. They understand that, they're, that it, or we understand and they understand that that it may not necessarily be a temperature related thing. It's got a whole lot more to do with the amount of sunlight in the sky and how long the days are. Right. So our bees in January have already been conditioned to that rollover. The days are getting longer in January. They anticipate the queen's just sitting there going, is it time, is it time, is it time? And we're going, not quite yet, but keep going. And uh, so- Hang in there, that's right. hang, hang in, in there. there. Be a good girl. That's right. So being prepared for spring. Last slide, and this slide is for information only. So I hope that we covered enough for you that we could make a, a whole a whole program out of each and every one of those months. We truly can, but we hope that you gathered enough that you see that spring is your busy time and that you can take care of your bees all year. But I can't help but plug that the TBS monthly magazine, Texas Bee Supply Monthly, I'm Blake and I are the editors and um, it's a good magazine. I will say, even though I'm partial, I think it's a good magazine. If you've not gotten it, go to texasbeesupply.com and on the menu bar, it just says free magazine. Mm -hmm. Kind of gives it right there. It's yeah. free and it'll come to your inbox when you register for it too. One of the things, or there's several of the things that I like about it is one that it, it's embedded with videos. Yeah. And that you, if, if you don't want to read an article, a lot of them are right there for you to see. Uh, you also get to see the the opinions of a variety of beekeepers throughout the state and the country mm -hmm. as to what their opinion is mm -hmm. of yeah you know, do when do you super or right. or uh, do you, do you reverse boxes or right. what kind of what kind of suit do you wear and it's pretty interesting to see the different the different uh, philosophies and thoughts and that that's that that ten beekeepers twelve answers well and I can tell you being the person that sits at this desk all day every day and I'm working on the April edition 
it is full of some very good recommendations from expert beekeepers and some of those faces you'll recognize in there. Um, free monthly tips webinar. I know a lot of you are on that, that it, Texas Bee Supply, we do that every, the first Thursday of every month. Go to texasbeesupply.com to sign up for that. It's wonderful. Uh, bee help and questions on texasbeesupply.com. If y'all got a question, bee help. YouTube channel, post high purchase webinar. If you buy bees from Texas Bee Supply, you're going to get an invitation for a free webinar and we're going to walk you through the whole process. Did you know that we have over 150? YouTube videos do. on nearly every topic in beekeeping. I do. I do. Isn't that crazy? Do you know that over 7,000 people are invited to join that monthly webinar? Yep. It's also available on Facebook. It is. And the last time. And item. Sandy, that's all. Oh, oh, on, oh, yes. Ongoing beginner and advanced classes from us. Oh, we have a splits class. Saturday. In person splits class. Saturday. At the, Anybody uh, want to go? At the Huffman Dayton store on Saturday. Yeah. So if you haven't been to that store. Have you been, Sandy? Not yet, but I want to go. <laughs> you need to go. It's we, a candy store. It's oh, incredible. We can pick you up tomorrow morning. <laughs> no, we can't. I got to work. But um, it's a wonderful store. Uh, and our classroom is awesome. It's awesome. Um, and we'd love for each and every one of y'all to come out and see the store, see us. Come to do a splits class with us. You can sign up on the website. Um, we are respecting we just, uh, uh, COVID, COVID protocols mm -hmm. and still, all, all employees wear masks yeah. when, when uh, uh, guests or customers or our students masks. are in the store yeah. mm -hmm. and it's a very comfortable yeah. environment. Yeah, it we is. provide the six foot distancing and all's good. I hear you got some door prizes from Texas Bee Supply. We do. We have some amazing ones. And uh, before we go there, I want to open it up to the group. What <laughs> questions do you guys have? You know, uh, Sherry and James are literally a wealth of information. So what questions do you guys have that you'd like to ask before we move on to door prizes? We regurgitate really well. <laughs> <laughs> no. I think we know it by now, a lot of it. <laughs> so you can open your line to ask questions or you're welcome to put them in the chat as well. Sandy's very good about looking at that chat and <laughs> reading your question. Okay, here's a question from Megan Turner. She says, one of my hives has a deep with a super on top left over from last year. Mama is laying in both. Mm -hmm. How do I make it into a double deep? Is I'm assuming that that super is a medium. Or is, that, a, is it a deep? Yes, it is. It's a medium. It's a medium. Well, there's a trick that you can do. It, it really isn't hard. You, you just have to make sure, thunk all the bees off of that medium super, get them down into that bottom box and put a queen excluder over it and let those bees emerge from that super and to never be laid in again. Mm -hmm. But you're gonna need to add a second deep to make room for her. So you may have to add that second deep on top of that bottom box after you've dunked all those bees on and then put the queen excluder in the super. So you're gonna end up going from being in a story and a half to two and a half stories mm -hmm. overnight. But that's the secret is don't thunk all the bees off that super down into the brood box, whether it's one or two, put a queen excluder to stop her from laying. The nurse bees will still go up there and finish tending till those emerge. And then it doesn't let her go back in. And, and something that's more common now than it used to be is that a lot of people do have a deep and a medium they do. for the brood nest. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. if you want to do honey supers on top of it, if the colony is strong enough, then do so. But a deep and a medium is really not bad, especially for someone who has issues with the weight of a colony. Yeah. You know, that, that upper box being a medium is lighter weight mm -hmm. than that that 100 pound deep might end up yeah, being. Those deeps get pretty hefty. Oh. Do. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, they and it's funny you say that because uh, one of the pages, two pages I did in the magazine today, mm -hmm. um, we asked the experts uh, whether they do single deeps, double deep, story and a half. What, what's mm -hmm. their scenario? So I've got, I think, five or six experts, Megan, that you might want to 
uh, look in the magazine next month, April 1st, around April 1st for their answer, what they think you I, should do. I was surprised at some of the names that responded differently than I thought they would have. Mm -hmm. Lauren Ward being one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lauren's, Lauren's a premium knowledge of beekeeping. Oh my gosh, yeah. And she had a response that's different than, than, but don't what, tell them what, I'm not, than what she would think. <laughs> What is he in the magazine, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and Dr. Dr. Jamie Ellis, I interviewed him. He gave me his input on it as well. And it, it several others. Same, same thing. That's We're, right. uh, you know, what we think we know in our little isolated area we live. Uh, yeah. Sometimes if we open our ears and eyes, we go, golly, different. there's other ways to do this. There are so many ways. <laughs> so um, many ways. Well, here's another question from Trisha Hedstrom, and she has two new packages she'll be installing this year. And so when you are doing inspections, and I would say for spring, right, as you're just starting out, what do you look for? What are the key things you look at when you're inspecting new colonies? Well, you know, one of the first things we could do to help her with that is we do have a video on installing package bees. Mm -hmm. And within embedded in that video is good information on mm -hmm. how to proceed over the, over the, the near future after it they is. are installed. Mm -hmm. After we've told you how to install them, you do that, what to look for then. Yeah. But a, a package of bees could be looked at as nothing more than a swarm in mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that uh, we have no resources. There's no honey nectar pollen. There's no pre-made wax or comb. So your goal is mm -hmm. going to be to feed, 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 yes. feed because your colony will not be able to keep up with the population. We've, we've found that some people are ordering nine pound, <laughs> nine pound no, yeah. package bees. That's a lot of bees. That's, That's a lot, lot of bees. I've never heard of such a thing that I, we I had just, somewhere in the class this year. I know we did. But if you got a, if you've got a two pound, that's yeah, okay, but we, we love the three pound TBS, concept. TBS. Uh, yeah, uh, ours are three pounders, right. the traditional and the bee buses. I want to back that question up to, uh, in general, once those, whether it's a package bees, a nuke, or a full colony, mm -hmm. the things that I'm looking for when I open up a box are population, mm -hmm. resources, the the brood viability, how does it look? Does did it the look healthy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. did, did, is it viable looking brood does it look healthy how do my bees look in general do i need to continue to feed what is nature providing them is it doing what i want it to do you know one of those pests one of the things that we tend to forget we, we, we blew over pests earlier but mm -hmm. small well, we high, small high beetles are opportunistic and that mm -hmm. they address or they they attack stressed colonies. Mm -hmm. uh, when a colony is stressed, it seems like no one's doing their job. The, the guard bees aren't guarding, the queen's <laughs> not laying, the, there's no one secreting wax. We all went on uh, sabbatical yeah, right. and just shut it down. <laughs> yeah. So a uh, stressed colony is, is, is an opportunity for small hive beetles to take over. So when I've got a new nuke that's been created or any time that we have a, 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 a swarm or package bees being installed, we want to be careful as that colony is beginning to grow and that new wax is being made that we're not breeding hive beetles as well to That's keep right. them under control. That's true. Yeah. That's good. So speaking of resources, um, Dion Marshall has a question. She says, I have a removal hive, my first with at least eight frames of brood, but very little resources. Okay. Should I add a deep because there's a lack of resources and lane room? That's her concern. Well, if she's full of eight frames of brood, yeah. she's fixing to, okay, what did I say earlier? For every fully capped frame of brood, when it emerges, are three frames of brood, fruit of bees. Bees. Oh, okay. Bees. Bees. Right. Bees. So bees. if you have some capped frames there now that are, that are close to emerging, they're going to yeah. have no place to live. So, yeah. so assuming that, that a good percentage of those are capped, they will be by now. Yeah then uh, it's kind of urgent that you get another box up there. I would say, I would say yes, a deep. And mm -hmm. I would do what we call pyramiding or priming that top box. Mm -hmm. Take some of the frames from the bottom box and put them in the top box. If you're low on resources, you be their grocery store. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and make sure you're feeding them. You can feed them pollen if you need to. Feed a pollen, Peter, pollen feeder dry feed 
I know that was. I'm not sure you're going to get Peter Piper. Peter. <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> oh, and I've been working since five thirty this morning. Yeah, my, my, so, my lips so are tangled. The resources uh, need to be Huge. brought back up. Brought, they do back up. Yeah. And feed, 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 feed until you get that twenty to thirty pounds. Yeah. And don't stop. Even though that, that's forcing your colony to grow, that's sure. the opposite of that is they're going to die. So, yeah, so, that's a lot of bees to feed. So, yeah, yeah. One, of the, things, one of the things that you want to get comfortable with is understanding what a dry cell is and what a wet, wet cell is, a wet brew, dry brood. And uh, your bees, like we talked about earlier, need to be swimming in royal jelly. If they're not, then there's not enough pollen. If they're dry, if the eggs and larvae are in a very dry cell, that means that they're not getting enough pollen. And you could you can address that instantly by doing pollen patties. Mm -hmm. And again, be cautious of the small Yeah, like she already has a lot of brood, so she doesn't need more brood. That's mm -hmm. my consumption. So right, just, for, just to get them over the hump. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I have another question from Matt, and this is one of those um, more passionate dialogues. <laughs> <laughs> Would you recommend um, buying a mated queen for a split or letting the hive requeen itself? We're scared. I know. That's a tough one. <laughs> we always believe, Sherry and I always believe that the known genetics of a commercially available queen, especially for someone who has oh, limited numbers of colonies, Right. Mm -hmm. The investment's worthwhile. Uh, understand what your genetics are going to be. Are you looking for comb bees? Mm -hmm. Are you looking for large honey producers? Mm -hmm. uh, do, if you don't care that your bees may be, what's the word? I don't want to use aggressive. I don't want to use defensive. What was the word you used earlier? Um, Bad attitude. Spicy. <laughs> if you don't mind. Spicy. Spicy. Yeah. Yeah. I said spicy. <laughs> spicy. Then go ahead and, and allow the virgin queen to mate on your property. Yeah. Uh, but we really only do that when we're in a, in a pinch. Yeah, only yeah, when just, we're in a pinch. You know, like we're getting ready to go on vacation, yeah. we have time to deal with it. Or, you know, there's times that you just have to let that happen. Um, if you've got to make a split and there's not anything, no queens available, then do it. And then just get your queen ordered and requeen when, you know. That's the exactly biggest yeah. issue with raising your own queen, in my mind, is it slows the process down so much. 44 days mm -hmm. because you're having to go from egg to laying producing worker bee from the time she lays an egg to the time you have a a, a forager bee is 44 days mm -hmm. so that's there's a lot of time in between there you want to sure have a queen that comes mated and then you're just one brood cycle yeah, then, you're, and then, then you're maybe three yeah. days away from yeah, having to lay eggs and, so uh, it just really is a yeah. lots of reasons but yeah definitely it's fun to raise your own queens so do it as an experience but uh store-bought queens from a known well-known breeder right. uh, usually don't disappoint you yeah yeah I've, I've done it both ways and sometimes it has to do with you know what's available um and to your point you know sometimes let them try to requeen if it looks like they're going to be successful and it's a strong colony then you know go ahead you know but at the same time i usually have a queen as a backup in case you know it gets to that 40 plus and i'm like mm, she's just the boys, good yeah. it. <laughs> the boys in our neighborhood um <laughs> they're not that sweet yeah and we just really we just really don't want to have those boys mating with our girls yeah um, i see somewhere and you i may be skipping over your question sandy but somebody asked go ahead our thoughts on top bar hives yes they did uh, go ahead no top bar hives are cool i mean i think that they're cool i think it gives you a a couple of, of ex exposure to a couple of things you don't get with a Langstrom. Uh, first, that's where you do buy package bees. That's a very yeah. good way to use package bees. It allows you to uh, get non-foundation front uh, mm -hmm. frames, the natural comb. Yep. Um, it's just um, it's just a different method. I think they're cool. It's a, it's yeah. a horizontal management concept as mm -hmm. opposed to a vertical like a Langstrom. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, it's kind of whatever your preference mm -hmm. is. Some people love worries because they worry highs because they build down. Yeah. Langstroth build up um, unless you're doing a horizontal Langstroth. Now we do have a, a class that we do on, on uh, converting a, a, a five frame Langstroth nuke into a top bar hive with natural foundation where we have 
segments where you, where you rotate them mm -hmm. out. It's kind of mm -hmm. fun also. For yeah. some, if somebody said, well, I know I got this deal on a nuke, but I really want a top bar. Mm -hmm. and, it's easy to and On the convert. internet, there are instructions on how to convert. On how to convert. Top bars are awesome though. They are. We They're do think that it's, do you, we do think that you need instructions above and beyond what you're going to get off the internet. You need someone to help you, a mentor or, or a deeper I'm knowledge. glad you said that because clubs, and I, and maybe mm -hmm. y'all does a better job than, than we did. Um, Montgomery County, we, we tried really hard to get top bar out there, but there was only like two or three people that did it. So mm -hmm. it wasn't really part of the normal education process of the club. Yeah. And I think a lot of clubs are that way. So you're going to be challenged in top bar to dig deeper than I think what our, uh, what is normally available on the airwaves. You do have the resource in Houston though with the uh, Houston oh, Natural Dean Beekeepers. Dean yes, Dean. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, last year we had Les Crowder on. So he oh. talked, um, or was it before that? Maybe the year before that, but, um, but yeah, we've had him on. And then of course, um, if anyone else is interested, interested, Les Crowder um, is his name, who is really the guru here in Texas around top yeah. bars. And he has his own awesome. Facebook site as well and hosts um, talks and education. So he's a great resource too. He and, uh, he and Natalie Missouri are doing yeah. a monthly uh, Zoom uh, through Hayes County Beekeepers. Yeah. So yeah. we're interested in that. That's a good, good reason. Yeah. And we have a lot of uh, members who do be a uh, top bar. I have a couple That's myself. Awesome. So yeah. That's great. Yeah. All right. Well, so I would love to keep the questions going. We could probably go all evening, but what I will tell you members is please reach out to Sherry and James. Um, as they mentioned, there is a ton of resources on Texas Bee, Bee Supply. Um, obviously, they are great resources as well um, for local, knowledgeable um, uh, resources. A lot of times we have individuals who are from the Northeast or sometimes from California that talk to us about bees, but you guys know the local stuff being right here in Cal in uh, Conroe and, and Montgomery. So uh, members don't don't ever shy away from reaching out and asking questions. All right, so I think we are ready to move on to our uh, door prizes and we have some amazing ones today thanks to Sherry and James and Texas Bee Supply. So Joe, you want to take the lead? You betcha. Okay, so we have three prizes today. And I guess we'll do this, that you get to pick your prize. Whoever goes, whichever name I've got here first, which I already have the names, we'll get to pick the prize first. So you have choice number one is a jar of cream honey. Uh, choice number two is a Texas Bee Supply smoker. And choice number three is a package of bees from Texas Bee Supply. So that's, I don't know, probably a value or something. It's not, they aren't cheap. So Which one would uh, I choose? Hmm. <laughs> that's a big deal, guys. That's awesome. <laughs> so let you know, our, uh, I, I sent a note out earlier, don't leave because you might get picked. Uh, somebody <laughs> left who was in first place. So anyway, oh, no. I'm not going to bother to tell you their names. They're gone. Anyway, so our first place person who got picked first is Diane Simpson. Diane, are you there? Uh, yourself. Do something. I'm gonna check, make sure she's still on. Oh, she says she's chatting. She says, she's yes, here. I'm still here. All right. All right, so Diane. What's your choice? Yeah, pick which one you'd like. <laughs> she picks the bees. Uh, shocker. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so our winner is uh, Jennifer uh, Windeborn. Jennifer, are you there? She's here. She's muted. Hi. Hi there. Hey, I love that picture behind you. That's awesome. Oh, great. My husband painted it. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is like eight feet big. Very cool. Do you prefer it, uh, creamed honey or a uh, smoker? Uh, a smoker since it's my first year. Good choice. All right, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
All right. And then our third winner is uh, Clinton Derrick. Oh, yeah, I'm here. Oh, and there you go. Hey, Clinton. How are you, You won sir? the creamed honey. Thank you. Great. Hey. Um, Joe, can I tell the folks how they need to pick up these prizes? Um, yes, you can. All right. Also send them all at you. Yeah. Yeah, you can go ahead and tell them that. Yeah, for, that'd be great. For, first prize is the, uh, Diane got the package fees. You can either call or go to the Dayton store, Texas Bee Supply Dayton store, and make arrangements of it to be shipped to you, or you can pick them up there. And then the second prize, the, the honey and the, uh, the smoker and the honey, are for the store to pick up at the store and the staff's waiting on you and you're going to love the store if you've not been. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. And boy, I, I want to tell you for the, for the club, we really appreciate the support mm -hmm. for the Houston Beekeepers Association from Texas Bee Supply. It's great to have you guys. It's kind of one of our partners, I guess I'd call you for lack of a better term. Yes. Go to's. <laughs> Thanks y'all. We appreciate y'all more than you know. Yeah. Thank you, Sherry and James. Great job. So enjoy it. And um, obviously, I love listening to you guys and, and you sharing your knowledge with us because you just oh, have so welcome. much of it. Not to mention, it's just fun. So <laughs> it, is fun. it is fun. Thanks for having us, y'all. And we will see you again really soon. We will. Thank you so much. All right, Houston Beekeepers, that wraps up our meeting for today. Come back and see us in April. Our next meeting will be, hold on one second, I'll get the date, April the 20th. So please keep an eye out for our next meeting to register. And of course, as always, be safe out there and enjoy your spring inspections. Hope it's going well. Talk to you guys again soon. Thank you so much. Good night.